they've asked me to uh, give sort of an overview of, of geoengineering. So uh, I'm going to, uh, here's our situation. We want to be happy. So we have stuff, and stuff uses energy, and, and a lot of energy produces CO2, which a lot of it stays in the atmosphere, which causes climate change, which has impacts, which has a negative feedback on our desire to be happy. So how do we break this loop? Well, we can do green things like conservation or efficiency or low carbon energy, but if those don't work, then people have suggested maybe taking the CO2 out of the atmosphere or doing solar radiation management. And absent that, we have adaptation. Ab absent that, we have suffering. So these blue things are called geoengineering. And unfortunately, the term or climate intervention is applied to both of them, but they're quite different. This one is treating the illness, and this one is treating the symptoms. So the first one, uh, taking CO2 out, is probably a good thing. I'm, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about this idea. So. Just one slide. This is the problem we're facing. This is the climate change we have in the future, these colored lines compared to climate change of the past 1,500 years. It's going to be huge, even uh, uh, with some mitigation. That's why we're concerned. I gave the first talk on geoengineering at an AMS meeting 10 years ago at the meeting in New Orleans. And I was, people were kind of in shock. You're thinking about this? And I'm surprised 10 years later how much interest there still is, unfortunately, because we haven't solved the problem. So what is geoengineering? It's defined as deliberate, large-scale manipulation of the planetary environment to counteract uh, anthropogenic climate change. So it has to be deliberate, it has to be a large scale, and it's not driving your car and emitting CO2. That's not geoengineering because your idea was not to cause climate change. The Nas U.S. National Academy of Sciences published a, a report two years ago, and I presented it at the AAAS meeting in, uh, in San Jose, and uh, that began a project to look at the impacts on ecosystems, which I'll tell you about in a minute. They said these two things are different, so they wrote two different books, one on carbon dioxide removal, one on solar radiation management. Why did they call it climate intervention? They said if we, call it if we call it engineering, it makes it sound like we know what we're doing. We're in control. So we want to call it intervention, which is an action to try and have an impact, but we're not sure what it is. This is really geoengineering. The ideas for solar radiation management include uh, space-based reflectors, creating a cloud in the stratosphere, brightening clouds in the troposphere, or brightening the surface. And I'm going to focus just on uh, stratospheric aerosols, which is the idea that's gotten the most attention, which is what, what Yaga talked about also. So I went to the first meeting on geoengineering uh, at NASA Ames, and this issue of Rolling Stone came out uh, that that day, that week, and across the top, it's got our two favorite people there, but across the top, Dr. Evil's plan to stop global warming. And inside there was an article about Lowell Wood, who used to work with Edward Teller, saying, oh, we can control the climate. I'm a physicist. I'm smart. We, I know what to do. And I went to this meeting for two days at NASA Ames, and the room was too hot, and they couldn't control the temperature of the room, but they were talking about controlling the temperature of the planet. And, and uh, there's these physicists and engineers thought, oh, this is a really cool problem. And I started writing down reasons why I thought maybe it wasn't such a good idea. And I got up to 20, and I published a paper, 20 Reasons Why Geoengineering May Be a Bad Idea. And since then, I've looked at it more, and my latest paper has this list of 27 reasons of, for concern or risks. But it also has benefits. Like if we could do it, we could reduce global warming, number one. And that might be, that benefit might be worth dealing with all of these uh, risks. But I think we have to evaluate each of them so that we can then make uh, informed decisions in the future. How can we answer these questions? The ones in red I've listed can be answered with indoor uh, experiments with climate models, uh, with a GeoMIP or, or other models. And so I'm going to talk about GeoMIP. Uh, we set this up uh, eight years ago to try and have organized experiments with climate models all doing the same experiments. And so far, we've had more than 50 papers, peer-reviewed papers, on GeoMIP, some of them in special issues of JGR and ACP. And it's continuing as part of CMIP-6. The first meeting was at, the, uh, at Rutgers, and uh, the second one was, uh, we've had meetings every year, the second was at Exeter, and then at, at Potsdam, then in Paris, I wore a beret, and uh, then we had one at NCAR, including uh, young scientists, and 
then we had one in Oslo, and the last one was uh, last summer in Maine. And three people have been to all of the meetings, Ben Kravitz and me and Ulrich and Niemeyer. The next one is going to be in Zurich, uh, the Monday and Tuesday after the EGU meeting, and you're all welcome to come. And I actually have money in my grant to pay for people to come, so if anybody wants to come, talk to me. We designed these standardized experiments building on the CMIP5, the, uh, CMIP5 experiments that all the modelers were doing. So we took RCP 4.5, 1% per year CO2, or brought four times CO2, and we said, let's either turn the sun down or put aerosols in the atmosphere to try and counteract the warming. And so G1 was uh, instantaneously turn the sun down to counteract four times CO2. Completely unrealistic experiment, but designed to get a high signal uh, compared to the noise. The next one was G2, more realistic, uh, counteract a 1% per year increase in CO2 and then stop after 50 years. G3 was to, gra rather than turn the sun down, do something more uh, realistic, which is uh, SO2 injection. And then G4 was instantaneously start putting in SO2 into the stratosphere as if there was a climate emergency. This was five teragrams of SO2 per year, about a fourth of a Pinatubo eruption per year. I'm going to talk about one new experiment. So there's more than 50 papers. I'm just going to talk about one of them, which is coming out in Nature, Ecology, and Ecosystems in, in, in a week. And uh, at, at that AAAS meeting, uh, Jessica Gurvich came up to me and said, I'm an ecologist. How will this affect ecosystems? And I said, I don't know. Nobody knows. Let's try and figure it out. So we, I started working with ecologists, and we looked at potentially dangerous consequences for biodiversity of solar geoengineering implementation and termination. So we took advantage of the archive of all the output, and we did looked at G4, and there were four climate models that had done all the experiments, three, three ensemble members each, for RCP 4.5 and for G4. Uh, and so we took advantage of those models. And this is the uh, global average uh, land temperature change for 50 years and then uh, the termination phase after you turned off the injection and the SO2 would come out of the atmosphere after a year or two and you get this rapid warming. Uh, during this time the temperature was about a degree colder and this is over land, over the ocean and this is for precipitation. And the error bar is, includes the uh, differences in the models and also the differences in the ensemble members. So it's a clear, clear signal. But you get this rapid climate change of cooling and then warming at maybe 10 times the rate that you would get if you'd done nothing. And the question is, what would this do to ecosystems? So we looked at this uh, concept of climate velocity. How fast would an organism have to move to stay at the same climate? So if the isotherms are moving northward, uh, poleward, how fast would you have to move to keep the same temperature? Or if the uh, precipitation was changing, how fast would you have to move? So you calculate it by taking the actual rate of temperature change and dividing it by the gradient of temperature, in, uh, the spatial gradient that we have now. And you end up with units of kilometers per year. This has been used already to look at global warming. We're the first ones to look at it with geoengineering. And here are the results. So the top left is the implementation phase, the first 10 years when you put in the SO2. The one on the right is the termination, uh, what the 10 years after you terminate. The one on the left is the observed climate velocities for the past 50 years. And one on the right is the uh, RCP 4.5, what you would get if you didn't do geoengineering. So you can see the climate velocities for global warming are not that different from what we've experienced with the warming we've already had. But when you terminate it, you get much faster velocities. And so the question is over land and over the ocean, we looked at ocean and land organisms, how fast would organisms have to move to keep the same climate? Interestingly, when you instantaneously put in uh, SO2, you get an El Nino and you get a, a huge warming and drought over the Amazon. So this was a, a surprise, and this is sort of a robust result that we get from volcanic eruptions, too. For precipitation, uh, as you would expect, the, the pattern is much, much more noisy and not quite as clear. Uh, there aren't very large precipitation velocities for the past and the future, but you can get this drawing, as I said, in the Amazon, 
and moistening here where it's already wet. Drawing in the Sahara isn't that of much consequence. So we looked at the distribution of these climate velocities over land and ocean for temperature and over land for precipitation. So the uh, black line is the average temperature velocities for the past. The yellow is with RCP 4.5. The red is for termination. You can see the distribution, a huge change in the distribution. And the blue is for implementation. And uh, over land, the differences are a little bit less than over the ocean. And precip, not much change. So how do we present this information? We, we made it this, this graph, which has two axes. One is the uh, how much, what the temperature velocities are for RCP 4.5, the bluer it is. And the top one is the G4 uh, temperature velocities uh, during termination. So if it's red, there's huge uh, changes with, with termination, and there's not much for, uh, for gl normal global warming. If it's yellow, both of them are high. You see a lot of red here. A lot of large temperature velocities that you wouldn't have gotten if you hadn't terminated geoengineering. Uh, then we looked at fragmentation. What if the temperature changes in one direction and the precipitation changes in another direction? You can't go both directions. And so the red on this figure are where the temperature and precipitation velocities are at least double RCP 4.5 and the direction is more than 90 degrees apart. So this would produce fragmentation of the ecosystems in many large areas, in many areas. Now you say, well, that would be stupid to terminate geoengineering instantaneously. And that's correct, of course. But you can think of scenarios where it might happen. There's a drought in China or flooding in, in, in India. You damn geoengineers, you're causing this. Well, you, you don't know that. You always have floods. And, well, I don't care. You better stop or we're going to shoot your planes down. So you can imagine society losing the, the means or the will to do this. We also looked at uh, different uh, organisms. So this is mangroves, mammals, fish, corals, amphibians, birds, mammals over, over ocean, over land, and reptiles. And we looked at... In biodiversity hotspots, how would these uh, uh, climate velocities change? And the one on the right is for termination. So this is for mangroves. You'd have huge uh, velocities for corals, uh, for fish, for mammals uh, in the ocean and over land. So uh, the conclusions were that geoengineering implementation and rapid termination can produce very large increases in both temperature and precipitation velocities compared to RCP 4.5. You could think of a, a, a RCP 8.5 like Yaga showed, and uh, so the velocities might be even higher if you had an even larger imbalance between the, the geoengineering and the, if you're trying to keep temperature constant, and, 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 the, uh, and the forcing. This is just an example. Termination poses a risk of fragmentation of climate niches due to divergence between the d direction of temperature and precipitation. Many di biodiversity hotspots have high exposure to extreme velocities. And, and ecological and conservation implications must be considered when we talk about this. Now, how do you test these things with the real world? You can use volcanoes as an analog, as, as Yaga mentioned. So these are the things that you can test with vo the volcanic analog. And so, for example, you get beautiful sunsets. This is after Krakatau. This is uh, the uh, volcanic sunset from Monk. And this is a picture I took over Lake Mendota. But Volcanic eruptions warn us that volcanoes could cool, stratospheric aerosols could cool the surface, reduce ice melt and sea level rise, produce pretty sunsets, increase the CO2 sink, but reduce summer monsoon precipitation, destroy ozone, produce rapid warming when stopped, make the sky white, reduce solar power, perturb the ecology, uh, damage airplanes, and, and so forth. Some people say geoengineering is cheap and easy, and it turns out uh, that we don't know how to do it. There are no uh, there's no equipment right now to do it, and it might be very expensive. But uh, Niemeyer and Timrek did this experiment balancing RCP 8.5 with geoengineering, and they got five to, uh, a Pinatubo, uh, five to seven Pinatubos per year, not four, by the end of the century if they wanted to balance this. That would be a huge amount. So uh, I encourage you to read all the six recommendations of this report, which I don't have time to go over. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to point out that 
A lot of the things on my list are not testable with modeling or volcanic analog. Things like human error, unexpected consequences, uh, commercial control, how do you decide whose hands on the thermostat. And so I don't think it's ever going to happen because of these insoluble problems. If we, do, uh, if we ever do it, we might want to shave off the worst, uh, geo the worst uh, climate change, but would it make it more dangerous if we did it? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have time for one other question. I think one in the back. For uh, climate science and engineering. Um, yesterday, outside of the ACS, there was a, a, a community press appearance. I don't know, otherwise, you just got a date. I, I watched it unfold in the morning and then throughout the day. So I know that's not uh, stratospheric, it's tropospheric. But uh, the Smithsonian Institute said that uh, jet airplane contrails could be doing inadvertent geoengineering. And so we're seeing a lot of that. But we've been complaining about dimming skies increasingly, and we'd laugh at if we use the wrong terminology, even though contrails don't form on pixie dust. Uh, you know, so what, what are we really hoping is going to be accomplished by doing more of that higher up, throwing more chemicals at the problem instead of, say, like, uh, finding another way besides releasing 70% of our energy as heat waste to help it? And so, so uh, Dave is going to talk about uh, cirrus thinning as an idea, another idea to let more heat out. Uh, there is no out if you're asking the chemtrails question, are we actually con trying to control it outdoors now? Talk about deliberate, but even inadvertent, we're doing it, and I know performance factors have changed, allowing for more contrails. The last IPCC report looked at the impact on climate change of con of contrails, and it's really tiny. Well, you have to look at the data and the science. We're seeing a rain coming out of power plants, flooding more on the roads. Yeah, that's okay. Well, we're seeing that. All right. And they think we need to move on. Okay. Please consider the other options.